Okay, so as mentioned, this will be uh, sort of handwritten notes will be recorded. Uh, so if you're watching this in future terms, uh, that's fine. Okay, so the basic idea of this course, the, the kind of high level goal of this course is you all graduate, so that's great, congratulations, you got a new job. Um, there's a whole bunch of people that are hiring security people, lots of different firms, lots of different industries. Uh, you walk in on day one, you're going to get handed something, and because you're the security person now, uh, they're going to say, is this secure? Okay, so is this thing that I just handed you X, uh, is it actually secure? So given X asked, is it secure? What do you do? Okay, so part of the problem with this, and it's actually a problem with this whole course uh, in a sense is, well, first off, the number of things that you could be handed is really broad, okay? Security applies to all sorts of things, right? Uh, so it applies to, you know, for example, software. Um, you know, hardware. What are some other things? Networks. Physical, non -ID, like document, physical document. Okay, okay. So there's physical security. That's a huge component. Locks, security cameras, safes, that kind of thing. So not all security is IT security. Uh, networks. Uh, there's different things. Hardware. Hardware is very broad, right? What does hardware mean? Uh, well, what do you think of when you think, if I say hardware, what do you think of? Pro uh, servers. Okay, so like some sort of computer or a server. Uh, but there's hardware, there's smaller forms of hardware, right? Like we all wear kind of like hardware now, like watches, smart, smart devices. Medical devices, embedded devices. Medical. Uh, software too. Um, so software is pretty broad. Uh, so there's applications is probably what we would traditionally think of, you know, 10 years ago as software. Uh, but there's... Databases? Sure, so you have databases. There's the underlying operating systems. Um, there's firmware, which sort of sits between software and hardware, like lower level drivers, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so lots in software. Uh, on the topic of databases, uh, what about the data itself? Okay, so security of data, data security is also a huge field. Right, so you have like big data, you have privacy, what about all the data that's being collected on you? Um, that type of thing. Another kind of hardware, maybe it's a special case of hardware. This isn't meant to be an exclusive list. I'm just trying to give you a sampling. Uh, right now, like we're really interested in Concordia and uh, what are called cyber physical systems. So a cyber physical system is something that has an electronic component. It's usually connected to the internet, but it has some sort of real world uh, like the result of that computer can actually affect change in the real world. You know, so like a power plant, a hydro plant or something like that. Uh, software could, you know, make decisions that would actually affect the power grid. Um, scale systems. Yes, so scale is usually the, the kind of embedded system that it types, tends to run on. Um, actually, I can put it here. Uh, cars, you know, we, we talk now like self-driving cars, like that kind of thing. Your car is like networked, right? What if, if someone can, can uh, infiltrate your car electronically? Uh, what could happen? Maybe you drive by something and it does a buffer overflow on your tire sensor uh, and now your car like 
it messes up the the computer system of your car like these are the the kinds of things that that could um that could become possible um, what else? Anything? Internet of Things like connected home security. Sure, sure. Stove, microwaves. Yeah, so that we can put that under hardware. So smart devices slash IoT, lots of those types of things. What about like totally different categories? Not just more examples of these categories. Okay, perfect. So what about people? So people are usually uh, the most vulnerable. So right now we, we traditionally, when you looked at security attacks and like say you're a firm and you get hacked, it used to be because of a network connection, right? So I came in through the network and there was something wrong usually with your software. I was able to exploit it. I took over that particular piece of hardware, right? That computer, that server. And then I was able to kind of move laterally amongst your, your organization. And it was a lot of work and I had to have these exploits that nobody knew about where I had to find the exact right servers that weren't patched or they weren't updated or whatever. Um, and so that's how I get in. Much easier way is I just show up and I'm like, hey, I'm from IT. I have the uniform on of the people, the exact company that does the IT services for that company. And I say, I need to fix something in the server room, right? And the office administrator who's sitting there doesn't know whether it's real or not, right? And they say, okay, go ahead, you know, it's it's back to the left, right? And now I'm sitting in the server room and I can do everything, you know, with no exploits at all, okay? So um, people, social engineering. Uh, sometimes the usability of a system is really bad. So there's a us usability tool that's in place. It's great. It works perfectly. It's a very strong defense. The only problem is people don't know how to use it. It's too complicated. They don't have the right mental model of how it works. They end up not using it because they hate it or they always disable it or they configure it wrong. Or when the system's saying don't do X, they ignore it and they do it anyways. Um, so poor usability can sink a system even if the technology is brilliant. Uh, any other ideas? Okay, so there's another set of things that we'll spend a lot of time on, which are, you can think of as protocols. So a protocol is a set of steps that your computer is going to do, for example, in order to securely connect to a web page. Okay? And you have to get that protocol right. Maybe there's some cryptography that's involved. Maybe there's some other aspects that are involved. And so, you know, when you set up this protocol, uh, you have to make sure that, that that's, you know, set up correctly. It's actually achieving what you think it's achieving, that type of thing. So this could fall under network if it's a network protocol, but not all protocols are networks. Uh, so the network protocols are one example of protocols. There's all sorts of cryptographic uh, protocols. Uh, a protocol doesn't have to be technical. It doesn't have to be a computer. Uh, people follow protocols at businesses, right? They, they call them uh, protocols sometimes. Sometimes they're just called procedures. Uh, if you go to an airport uh, and you, you, know, you go and you check in and uh, they check whether you're on the no-fly list and then you go to security and then they do some checks of your passport and your boarding pass and then they check your luggage, that's a protocol. Right? Why do you show that piece of ID to that person? What's that person looking for? That's actually an example we'll look at in this class, but that's a, it's a human protocol, right? It's, it's not involving machines, but it's, it is a sort of step-by-step -step recipe that's being followed to achieve some specific security goal as a result, okay? And there could be problems with that protocol. Maybe there's some loophole that allows you to do uh, something nefarious. So procedures. Uh, so policies, regulation, that type of thing. Uh, we'll look at um, different policies that your browser has. So your browser has a bunch of policies for like, let's say you open a website, what, the, what other websites are allowed to modify this information? If a website sets a cookie, what other websites can access that cookie? Um, those types of things. And there's, there's major implications 
uh, when you start thinking about big data and privacy on the web and things like that, that really boil down to little engineering decisions that were made. Um, and there was no right or wrong decision. You could do it this way or you could do it that way. And for historical reasons, whatever, we decided to do it one way. And then there's all these ramifications. And when something like the web changes, you know, it, it doesn't, these things were decided back in the 90s or earlier. Uh, and now the web looks completely different than it did in the 90s. And you don't always think through the implications. And yeah, you could go and change it, but then you're going to break all the websites that were developed for the older web. And so you get in these like really kind of tough situations where you have a policy that you're not particularly happy with, but overhauling it without breaking everything and maintaining backwards compatibility and stuff like that um, are things that you want to do. And so that really limits your options moving forward. Okay, so policies are another thing that are, are important. Um, access control policies is another example of policies. So who's allowed access to various things, uh, that type of thing. Is there some way to bypass the access policy? Um, yeah. Anyone else have any dying, uh, a dying need to, to label anything else? we missed okay so anyway so this is an example of how broad security is there's more to it not comprehensive but it gives you an idea now let's go back to the purpose of this course is it secure what do you do so let's say that I'm going to teach you in this lecture how to tell whether something's secure or not okay is that actually a realistic goal can I really tell you Here's one lecture, I'm gonna tell you how to evaluate the security of something. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at a network or you're looking at an airport procedure or you're looking at a person, you can apply this methodology and figure out whether it's secure or not, right? Not gonna happen, that's completely unrealistic. Uh, the second thing is you're gonna to have to know, if you wanna know whether this um, cryptographic protocol is secure and you don't know anything about cryptography, are you going to tell whether it's secure or not? No, okay? So before you even think about evaluating the security, you have to have like kind of the background information, even just to understand the functionality before you start thinking about uh, the security of something, okay? So that's what makes this course actually really tricky to teach because um, I basically have a choice. I can either teach you high level methodologies, which could apply to lots of these scenarios, but because you guys, I'm not assuming any of you know anything about crypto. Maybe you took 6110, maybe you do, but I can't assume all of you do. Uh, I don't know that all of you know all about operating system and I don't know that you all know about browsers and things like that. I can't give you a methodology that's going to teach you all of that type of stuff, okay? So in this course, it's kind of weird and there's a bunch of different topics, but we're basically going to do a few things. In the first couple lectures, what we'll do is we'll look at really broad or really broad methodologies that are almost too broad to be useful, but what they do is they allow you to kind of organize your thoughts around security, okay? So they're really broad. They don't really tell you what exactly to do to evaluate security, uh, but they, they get you to sort of brainstorm what some attacks might be and to start thinking broadly about uh, what security might look like, okay? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is to give you an actual flavor for what methodology looks like, I kind of have to teach you how something works before we can talk about the security. So what we'll do is I've picked a couple samples, uh, like, uh, and they're, they're sort of arbitrary, but also I picked them because they probably are useful in other courses and they're also interesting. There's interesting things to be said about these, uh, but they're, they're, we'll do a deep dive on a couple different technologies. So one example that we'll get to very quickly is SSL or TLS or HTTPS. They're all kind of the same thing. We'll go through the exact differences. Um, is the purpose of this course to teach you about HTTPS? It's not, okay? But in order to think about how I would evaluate the security of that, you have to know a bit about how it works. And so I'll teach you how it works and then we'll talk about how you would evaluate the security of it, okay? So that's how the course is sort of structured. So some high level techniques and then some deep dives on specific topics. And for those specific topics, we'll look at usually one specific topic and one specific methodology, one specific topic, one specific methodology. So you'll get a sort of illustrative example uh, for each of them. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the main point I wanna make is uh, evaluation is hard.
Okay, so there's no single methodology that works for everything. That's sort of reason number one. Uh, reason number two is before you can think about the security, you have to understand it. Um, so uh, And contrary to what you might think, you don't actually have to be an expert in it. So if I want to look at the security of operating systems, it helps. If I'm an expert in operating systems, I'm certainly going to do a better job. Okay, But even if you start to learn the basics of the functionality, you can actually, with a sort of security mindset, you can make a lot of progress on understanding something. So expertise is, is great. Uh, if you can achieve it, but you can do a lot even if you're not an expert, okay? So you shouldn't say, well, I don't know much about that, therefore I'm not going to be able to contribute. If you know a bit about security, you can sort of jump in and, and contribute to things, even if, you, if you're not like a really an expert uh, in it. Okay, the final point I want to make, I'll phrase it this way. Security is um, necessary, but not sufficient. So this is maybe a, a slightly philosophical point, but what does it mean? What does it actually mean to say something secure? Let's take a specific example. Let's say, let's say I have an application uh, and I want to say this application is secure. Okay, I, I wrote a game, uh, it's on uh, my iPhone. Uh, I wrote it and it's secure. What does that mean? It has no vulnerabilities. Okay, so what it means is uh, it has no vulnerabilities. That's a very reasonable uh, definition of what security means, okay? Now, notice that we did. We didn't say, we didn't actually say anything positive about why it's secure. What we said is it doesn't have these other things. So we, the way we define security isn't, it's not secure because it has X, Y, and Z. It's secure because it doesn't have X, Y, and Z, where X, Y, and Z are known vulnerabilities, okay? So security is always this kind of negative concept, meaning that you never assert that something's secure. All you say is, well, it's secure because it doesn't do this, or if you do this, it won't do this, okay? So security is always kind of flipped around. And so what that means is, at the end of the day, is you can never actually say something secure. All you can say is, um, it doesn't, for all the security attacks that I've thought about, it's not vulnerable to them, okay? Does that mean that there won't be some security attack that I haven't thought about that comes out tomorrow and I'm not going to be vulnerable to it? No, I can't say that at all, okay? So you can never actually say something secure. You can only say, um, you know, based on what I know, it doesn't, it's not vulnerable to, to what I know, okay? Um, now, you still need to do that. Right, you still need to test up. It's not that that's a waste of time. Oh, I can never say that's secure, so why even bother security testing, okay? Uh, so you do have to test it against all the vulner known vulnerabilities, okay? But it's just not sufficient, okay? So that's a necessary step, but it's not a sufficient step. Okay, so after evaluation, you can't conclude that it's actually secure. You can only say, well, it's at least not insecure with respect to these set of vulnerabilities that I know about. Okay, 
And so that approach, sometimes it, like if it's a network device, you might call it penetration testing, uh, where you're like, okay, here's, here's all the attacks that I know about. I'm going to bang, 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 and try them all. And then you're going to check off, yeah, it's not secure to this. It's not secure, insecure with regard to this. And like I say, that's strictly necessary. It's not a bad thing to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. You absolutely have to do it. It's just not sufficient, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't mean that um, you won't be vulnerable to something that you haven't actually thought about. Okay. Questions about this? All right, so let's talk about some uh, high-level methodologies. Okay, so these uh, methodologies, they're so high level that they do apply to people and they apply to protocols and they apply to procedures. Uh, so they're, they're, they're that, at that general. And so that's going to tell you that they're not going to give you, you can't just take one of these methodologies, apply it to something you don't know much about and really do a good thorough job of, of how to evaluate something. But what, so I don't want to oversell what they offer, okay? But what they do offer is they give you some ideas of where to start. Okay, so usually when you start, you're sort of brainstorming ideas. What, what are the possible vulnerabilities? What are the attack vectors that might be possible uh, with a particular thing? Um, and so they give you a way to kind of organize it. And then when you actually do the evaluation and you give it to someone, let's say it's a report or something like that. Uh, the other thing is the person who receives it, they want to make sure it's comprehensive. Uh, comprehensive meaning that you didn't miss something. Okay, that's, that's the most important thing. And so if you just have this free flowing, you know, I did this and then I did this and then I did this, that's all great, but like how do I know you didn't miss something, right? And so if you can actually kind of organize your approach, your methodology, uh, what you learned, that type of thing, uh, then it's a little easier to see, oh, you missed this category, or you missed this category, okay? So these three techniques are really just about kind of brainstorming and organizing uh, your security approach so that the person who receives it can do a better job of evaluating the evaluation to, to see whether the evaluation is good, okay? It's not a silver bullet that's going to let you find a vulnerability in a cryptographic protocol because even if you don't know anything about cryptography, okay? It's not, it's not going to do that uh, for you. So we'll look at three. Um, there's lots, but uh, these are three that I like. Okay, so the first is called STRIDE, which is an acronym. And it's about evaluating, you have some security solution and you want to evaluate whether it's secure or not. It's a high level methodology that's going to help you with that. Okay, so that's sometimes the task that you're given. You're given something, is this secure or not? Uh, Stry can help you to a certain extent organize your thoughts around it. Uh, another time, another kind of question that you might be given that's slightly different is, hey, we want to change how we do X. Uh, can you pick the most secure way? There's, there's four things that we know about. We know about A, B, C, and D. Um, you know, you don't have to invent your own. It's not that we invented one and we want to know whether it's secure or not. We want you to look at A, B, C, and D and just figure out which one's the best, uh, which one's the most secure for our needs. So how do you do a cross comparison against existing solutions? Um, so we'll look at something called an evaluation framework.
And then the final thing we'll look at is something called an attack tree. And an attack tree is, it's very, it's more similar to Stride. So it has nothing to do with evaluation frameworks. It's, you're looking at a single solution. Um, but the approach is sort of different. So usually with Stride, you're thinking about what are all the attacks on this system? Um, so you're starting the systems in the middle and then you have a bunch of attacks sort of on the outside. Uh, with the attack tree, you kind of invert it. So what you do is you start with an attack. You say, I want to accomplish X. What are all the ways that I could accomplish X? Okay, so what are all the different paths that could potentially lead me to compromising this system? Okay, so it's just, it's sort of inverted in terms of how you do it. You can use stride to form your attack tree. You can use your attack tree in thinking about stride. So these aren't like, you can sort of mix and match them uh, to a certain extent as well. You can use stride in determining the criteria for evaluation framework. Um, so these aren't, they're not like very discrete. You can sort of mix and match concepts from them. But anyway, so we'll present them as three kind of different uh, concepts. So this is evaluating a single threat on a system or on a solution. Okay, and in terms of order, I'm going to spend the least amount of time on Stride. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, I don't know how long it'll take, maybe 20 minutes or something like that. Evaluation framework will spend a little more time, like maybe half a lecture. And attack trees will spend a lot of time on. But usually, because the example I give is very thorough and a lot of it's just giving you background on the example, it usually takes two, maybe three lectures uh, to do a big example of an attack tree. Okay. All right, so I'll start with stride. Okay, threats, or sorry, stride is really just, it's a classification of different kinds of attacks. So if you attack a system, there's lots of different ways that you might do it. There's a different properties of the system that you're trying to vi uh, violate. And what stride does is it just kind of classifies them into one of six categories. So stride's an actually an acronym. So there's the S, the T, the R, the I, the D, the E, all stand for different categories of threats. So I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second. Um, and so it's nothing fancy, uh, but it does get you thinking about, like sometimes you, you get really centered on one kind of attack. And so sometimes if you think about stride, then you might be like, oh yeah, is there this other category of attack or is, is this other category of attack apply uh, to this particular system? So it's really for brainstorming uh, and that's, that's basically uh, all it does. Um, you can think of it as an extension of something you may have heard of So there's a basic classification that's called CIA, not the spy agency in the United States. Um, so CIA is also an acronym. It stands for confidentiality. Integrity and availability. So strides exactly the same thing. It's just going to add six new categories, or sorry, three new categories to bring it up to six. Um, so the main thing, so this is pretty good. This isn't a terrible way to start. Um, there's certainly a big difference between confidentiality and integrity. Okay, those are two core concepts. They're actually quite different. Uh, what attacks look like in one space or the other space differ. What the solutions or how to prevent the attacks look, the tools that you'll use are, are going to look different for, the other, for those two. And then availability is also sort of interesting. Um, a lot of people for a while, like this, I don't know who came up with this. It's just sort of this sort of folk like kind of thing that's been kicking around for like decades. Um, but every now and then people will look at it and they'll be like, oh, that, that's good, but it misses, it misses authentication. You know, we really need, we need CIAA for authentication. Or I don't really see how access control fits. Access control, it's, you know, it's kind of integrity, but it's not really integrity. You know, maybe we need to add that as a separate category. And so, anyways, different people have sort of extended it in different ways. Uh, Stride is another example of that. So uh, they, they extend it. Uh, what Stride has going for it is, first off, it's a little better than CIA. 
Uh, so it's not like the the uh, the absolute best. And you know, in five years, if we're still giving this course, I won't necessarily be um, teaching Stride. But uh, the things that it has going for it is it's better than CIA. Uh, it's backed by a major company, so Microsoft Research uh, is is the uh, someone at Microsoft Research produced this model. It was implemented within Microsoft, and then other people started adopting it. And there are some tools, uh, so we don't really go into the software tools, but there is this whole like kind of way of modeling a system and applying Stride to it in a kind of software environment uh, that you can use and you can get into uh, if you want to do something more formal on threat modeling. Um, so that tool is used by some people. It's used by Microsoft and others uh, in real life. And so anyway, so that's why we, we uh, that's why I'll, I'll show you Stride. Okay, so Stride uh, stands for, Now you get to watch me struggle with this. Um, this will work, it just give me one second. Okay, so these are the, the categories here. Uh, so we have spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, escalation of privilege. All of these are um, their attacks. So take availability. So we saw in CIA, there's this concept of availability. Availability is the positive property. It's the property you want. You want availability. And if you have availability, you don't have denial of service. So denial of service is the attack that defeats the property or you want confidentiality, so that means you're not disclosing information. So information disclosure is the attack, confidentiality is the property that's achieved, okay? So you can see that CIA is in this model. So information disclosure corresponds to confidentiality. Uh, so this is C, uh, this is availability, and then I integrity they call tampering. So if you don't have integrity, it's because someone can tamper uh, with your data. And then in addition, they introduced three new properties. So one's called spoofing, which is tied to authentication. One's called repudiation, which will take a little effort to explain. Uh, and then the other one's called elevation of privilege, uh, which has to do with kind of access control and authorization. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll go through uh, these six lightly. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I'll give you some examples uh, of all six of them. However, we're at our break time, so uh, why don't we take a 10 minute break and then you can come back at 7.02 ish and uh, we'll pick it this up. Okay. All right, so what we'll do is uh, I'll just very quickly, it's, this table is probably pretty self-explanatory and I'm not, I'm not gonna explain in much more detail than this, but I will give you a few uh, examples that, that maybe aren't covered in the table. Um, okay, so these are the, the threats. So it's swoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, escalation of privilege, or elevation of privilege. Um, there will be an exam question that's like, what kind of attack is this circle STID or whatever? So you should know this. I guarantee you that I will ask that question. Uh, I ask it every year. The scenario will be different, but anyways. Um, okay, so spoofing. So what's spoofing? So spoofing is basically pretending to be something that you're not. Uh, usually when you think of spoofing, you think of maybe social engineering. So I gave that example of you go into a company, you pretend to be an IT staff, but you're not actually an IT staff. Uh, so that would be an example of spoofing. Um, a less obvious example of spoofing um, is uh, you can think of, of actual data itself. Um, so you might have a file uh, that's supposedly the system file, but it's really another file or something like that. Um, so you can have data uh, in terms of spoofing. Um, some of these attacks start to like, like a, a proper attack would actually maybe do a couple different things. So you can think of these as, as components of an attack. So not every attack is just a spoofing attack. It might be spoofing following by tampering. 
you know, to do denial of service or something like that. Okay, so a lot of attacks are going to mix and match different ones of these, uh, but there will be different components. The other thing too, just for the exam itself, it's always confusing. Um, when you classify the attack, it's based on classifying how you're doing it. So if I'm going to spoof because I want to bring your network down, then that sounds like, well, it could be spoofing because that's what I'm doing. But what I want to do is bring your network down. That's the denial of service. So is that a denial of service attack or is that a spoofing attack? So it's always how you're doing it. Okay, so that's a spoofing attack. It doesn't matter what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so that's an attack followed by an attack. So there is a denial of service attack that's following the spoofing attack, but the spoofing is the actual attack itself. Okay, so always drill down on, on what is the actual attack here. And then after you have the attack classified, then you can think about what are you trying to achieve? What's the goal? And then what's that goal? That might be an example of something uh, slightly different. Um, another way that spoofing works that, that you see a lot now, I'll, uh, I'll just put some sort of like notes here, random notes. Okay, a lot of vulnerabilities now that we see, especially in software, uh, they follow a certain template. Uh, the template is TOCVTOU. Anyone know what that stands for? No, it's a really weird acronym. Okay, let me, uh, let me I won't tell you what it, let me give you an example and then I'll tell you what it stands for. Um, okay, so this is a ridiculous example. Uh, some of you probably, you're probably all over 18. Uh, let's say some of you aren't over 18, you're 17, and you want to go to a bar in Quebec and you're not allowed to go in the bar, okay? Uh, so you show up at the bar and they say, uh, can we see your ID? Uh, so this is a spoofing attack. You could have a fake ID, right? Fake ID would be example of spoofing. Um, but uh, let's do a slightly different attack, okay? So let's say that you show your ID, you get your friend, your friend's over 18, your friend's 21. Uh, they show their ID to the bouncer and the bouncer says, yes, you're over 21. You can, so they look down at the card, they see that you're over 21, and they say, yeah, you're allowed to go in, they hand your card back. Now, imagine if you could kind of suspend time. So what you do is you have your friend hand the card, and the bouncer is looking at the card, and then somehow you're able to switch places with your friend, okay? So now you're standing in your friend's place, and so when the bouncer says, uh, yeah, you're over 21 and hands the card back. They're actually handing it back to a completely different person and that completely different person who's not over 21 walks through the door of the bar, okay? So that's absolutely ridiculous. Would never happen in real life. And because it will never happen in real life, it's really hard to think of that, okay? Security is also hard because you have to have the, uh, the mental model of how security works, okay? And a lot of our mental models are based on experiences in real life, right? Like. Uh, keeping things secret, I know how to do that because I know physically, you know, like I have some password that I wrote down on a piece of paper, I know I put that in a book or I put it in some weird place. So I can take that knowledge, I can translate it to a digital world and it kind of works the same. But some digital attacks, some attacks work in a digital space that just don't make sense really in a physical space. So this is an example. So TOC v TOU stands, stands for time of check versus time of use. And basically the, the threat model is uh, you have something that's legitimate. You have some police guard, some software or something that's checking whether it's legitimate or not. It does the validation and before it can return and say, yes, this is valid, you swap out what's being checked, okay? So it does the time of check and then by the time you get around to using it, then it's actually switched, okay? So someone else swapped it out. Does this work on a computer? absolutely works on a computer, okay? Because you can suspend time, okay? It Do doesn't work in real life, but it works on a computer, right? So you have a file and you run your antivirus on that file and then you interrupt it right after it's done, but before it reports that it's good, you replace it with your malicious file, right? And then your antivirus goes, you, re you resume your antivirus and it's like, okay, I was just about to say this file's okay. So then it proceeds and says this file's okay, okay? So, uh, that's time of, so the time of check and the time of use. So what you need to do is you need to make those two things atomic, 
as we call it. So you have to be sure that the thing that you're using is the same as the thing that you uh, checked. Okay. So anyway, that's that's just one example of um, a sort of attack pattern that shows up a lot, especially in software. And you see a lot of vulnerabilities now uh, that are actually examples. The reason you do this is because you want to do some sort of escalation of privilege, uh, but they, they tend to fall under this template. Okay. So that's sort of an advanced version of spoofing. Okay. Tampering is modifying uh, something. So it, usually we think of it in terms of data or code. It could be some sort of physical object. Uh, so maybe you go to Best Buy and you buy a router and you know it's a Cisco router, it's in a bubble package uh, and that kind of thing. How do you know that the government didn't tamper with that? How do you know they didn't get a, a truck full of these routers? They didn't take off all the bubble wrap, take all the routers out of the boxes, install some malware on it, put them back in the boxes, wrap them back up, and then ship them off to Best Buy. And so the answer is you don't know, right? And in fact, they do do that. We know that, that some governments have done exactly that kind of thing, okay? Um, so anyway, so integrity could apply to more than data. Integrity we'll do a deep dive on when we talk about HTTPS. So integrity and confidentiality are two of the core properties of HTTPS. So we'll, we'll, we'll circle back and talk more about uh, tampering there. Repudiation is kind of weird. Um, it's not something that you might think of, uh, but repudiation basically is you do something bad, you get caught doing something bad, and then you say, I didn't do it, okay? And so I ha I'm now in this position where I think you did it. I have some evidence that you did something, but you're saying that you didn't do it. How do I figure out whether you did it or not, okay? Do I have enough information at my disposal to make a decision about whether this thing occurred or it didn't occur? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've been teaching all day so and talking all day. Um, okay, so uh, non-repudiation. So maybe you order something from Amazon. It shows up. Uh, it's very expensive. And then you go back to Amazon and you say, I never received it, right? Uh, but you actually really did uh, receive that item. Uh, so that's a repudiation uh, a non, sorry, that's a repudiation attack, okay? So a property that's, that's non-repudiation is you have some protection against it. So how would you achieve non-repudiation? Uh, so what you need to do is you basically need to collect a lot of evidence about things that, that have happened. So it's usually, you can't usually completely solve it, but you can do things like make people sign things like digital signatures, uh, keep good logs, error logs, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, if it's something like mail, like the postman might, uh, or post person, I should say, uh, they might take a picture of the package sitting at your door. Uh, so they, they prove that they drop it off at least. And uh, so then now it's your responsibility. Um, so that's the kind of thing that's centered around uh, repudiation. Uh, another thing you can do is you can, uh, let's say you um, uh, buy something with Visa and then you say, I never bought it. Uh, then what Visa will do is they actually will side, they can't decide, they don't know, maybe you put the transaction through, maybe it's a fraudulent transaction. They actually have no way of telling at all. So their policy in general, most credit cards will be, they'll side with the consumer the first time. So the first time you do that, they'll say, we think the consumer is right. They'll actually do what's called a chargeback. So the merchant's on the hook for that amount of money. So I go buy new headphones. Uh, from Best Buy and I say that's a fraudulent transaction, uh, Visa comes back and says, okay, we, we believe you, uh, we'll charge that back to Best Buy. So now Best Buy has to cough up $200 or whatever uh, for the headphones and that's good. And you might say, well, that's a terrible policy. Why, why aren't everyone charging back everything? Well, if you do it twice or you do it three times, then they're gonna think that, that the problem's with you, not with Best Buy, okay? So sometimes uh, non-repudiation you do, uh, you have different policies depending on, you have different thresholds for like how much you tolerate uh, uh, different yeah, things. Uh, so that would speak to procedures or policies. So procedures and policies are something else that we'll, we'll consider in this course. Uh, information disclosure violates confidentiality. Basically you have a secret, you want the secret to say secret. Uh, so that's confidentiality. Uh, this is probably the most obvious security property. A lot of people actually make a mistake where they think all of security is about confidentiality, right? Or all of cryptography is about encryption and encryption is about confidentiality. <coughs> so um, 
so yeah, so there's more to security than confidentiality. Confidentiality, confidentiality is very important. Uh, confidentiality is also something that we'll spend a lot of time on when we go through the SSL example, because it's really about integrity and confidentiality. Those are the two things that you get uh, with it. Denial of a service uh, uh, violates availability. Uh, so this is basically you're going to crash some process. Um, sometimes denial of service is the end goal. Uh, so you want to bring down this website because you don't like what that website is saying. And so that's the goal. That's it. Um, sometimes denial of service is in service of a broader attack. So for example, let's say there's this kind of time of check versus time of use thing. So you show up, you have some data and the server, the service that you're using is going to go ask someone else whether this is valid or not. And so what you do is you denial of service the other thing so it can't ask. It asks, but it never gets a response. And then if it doesn't get a response, it has to decide, am I going to deny this user? Or am I going to just do a best effort? If I don't get a response, then I'll just assume that it's okay, right? So unfortunately, some security systems, including critical security systems, will just, if they don't hear back from a check, then they'll just say it must be okay. Uh, so we'll do these checks on a sort of best effort basis. And yes, and so you might do a denial of service in that case to like kill a certain component or something like that that's going to do a check for you. Um, so that's, that's another example. Um, denial of service also note, um, just for your interest, uh, if you think of the classic denial of service attack, that's usually where um, you have a user, Alice, you have a website. And so Alice wants to bring down the website. What does she do? She uses her whole bandwidth whatever she has available to, spams the website with as much traffic as possible. And if Alice's bandwidth is bigger than the website, the website goes down. If the website's bandwidth is bigger than Alice's, the website stays up. Okay, so that's very, very simple. Is a website's bandwidth more than Alice's? Probably, right? Most websites are, or they'll use something like Cloudflare or something like that. Uh, uh, content distribution networks to make sure that their bandwidth is sufficient uh, to, to resolve it. So back in the 80s, you know, maybe this worked, doesn't really work now. Um, so then people are like, okay, here's what we'll do instead. Uh, Alice will get a bunch of friends, people she knows, computers that are, um, have malware on them that she rents out, you know, so botnets, uh, whatever the case may be. And she says, you know, get ready on your market set, go. And then all of these spam it with their full bandwidth. And now the question is, okay, does the website spam with more than the sum of all of these bandwidths, okay? And so it's actually more reasonable that the sum of these might exceed the website's own um, uh, uh, bandwidth. So this is called distributed denial of service. Or DOS, okay? And so distributed D DDoS, you know, that was cool like in the 90s or the 2000s, okay? DDoS kind of works uh, if they're on Cloudflare or something like that, it's probably not gonna work. If it's Concordia and they're managing their own services, uh, you could maybe you could bring, maybe bring down my personal website using a, a, a DDoS attack. Today, easier to coordinate, you know, with botnets and things like that. You can rent out servers. Uh, you can get tools. Like sometimes people have political motivations for bringing down websites, and so they'll have different tools that will assemble people and get their bandwidth all pointed at a particular website. Okay. So this is um, so it used to be this. Now denial of service moved towards distributed denial of service. Um, but lately what we've seen is uh, a, another variant on distributed denial of service, um, which looks like this. Okay, so what Alice is going to do is she's going to spam a server as fast with as much bandwidth as she has, but she's not going to spam the actual direct website itself, the victim of the website. What she's going to do is she's going to find some other kind of web server that happens to be on the internet. I'll give you some examples of it. Uh, so one example is called NTP, which are 
Uh, it's at, this is actually a protocol. Uh, so basically any web server on the internet before this started happening, uh, it had this really nice uh, feature where uh, you could go up to it and you could ask it, um, what time is it? And the server would tell you what time it has, okay? And so people thought, well, we'll just leave this open and if anyone needs to know what time it is, then they'll just go and they'll go ask it. Now it turns out that you can ask lots of other things. So you can go to the server and you can be like, hey, tell me like something about like all the people that have connected to you recently or something. Um, or anyway, there's, there's different queries uh, that you can ask an NTP server, okay? And for some of these queries, what you ask is really small. So you have a question, like give me a bunch of data about X, and then the response is like this big, okay? So you ask a small question and you get a big response, okay? So then what you can do is if these querying, if this sort of protocol runs over something that can be spoofed, uh, so UDP as opposed to TCP is a protocol, a network protocol where NTP servers tend to use and uh, it can be spoofed. So what you can do is you can say, hi, I'm Google, I wanna know all the information about X and then it will say, and that's a really short question and it will answer with a really long answer and it will send it off to Google, okay? And so what ends up happening is you ask the server these short questions as fast as you can. They answer as fast as they can and their answers are like way bigger than what you're asking and you point the answer to a different server other than yourself, okay? Um, and so what happens is that you end up hitting this website with the maximum bandwidth of this, of this server, not of your own personal server, okay? Now, a lot of these servers are like backend, internet backbone servers, like servers that handle lots and lots of data, okay? They're like core servers uh, that are they're part of, like that Rogers puts up or that Bell puts up or something like that, okay? They're like really hardcore servers. They have a lot of bandwidth that's at their disposal. And further, you can combine it with this attack as well. So you can do di distributed plus. So this is called uh, amplification. Uh, another example that, that people have looked at recently is DNSSEC. So this is a secure version of DNS. You can be like, hey, what's the, the certificate for this website? That's a really short query. The certificate comes back, it's big, it's got all these crypto keys, and then that certificate's signed by another certificate that's signed by another certificate that's signed by another certificate, and so you get this like really big response, okay? So you can get amplification of you know 10 times, 100 times um, uh, in terms of, of how much amplification you get. So you get to multiply your bandwidth, then you get all your friends uh, to do the exact same thing, uh, and anyway, so this is sort of where we're at with denial of service today, um, is you get distributed denial of service plus amplification. How do you fix it? Well, it's kind of hard to fix. So you, you can go around, turn, on, turn off NTP. You can be like, well, no one uses it anyway. So that's a pretty easy one. People use DNSSEC. You can't just turn it off. Um, you could say, well, let's make it so that you can't spoof it. Like this attack doesn't work in, unless if I can spoof the response. And so one way that you can make it so that uh, it can't be spoofed is you can switch to TCP. So TCP requires you form a connection. So that's a handshake. So you have to go forward, back, and then you're ready to to do your data, okay? So if you if you spoof in TCP, you say hello, and then the server says hello back to Google, and Google's like, I never said hello to you, why are you saying hello to me? And then it just drops it, okay? Uh, so that's that's easy. Um, but, but anyway, so now people are running around turning off things and switching UDP protocols to TCP protocols and things like that uh, in order to, to prevent denial of service. But, um, that's, anyways, that's a sort of tangent on the current state of denial of service. Okay, um, the final thing is uh, elevation of privilege. Sometimes we use the term escalation. I usually think of it as escalation. Okay, uh, so what this has to do is it's sort of with access control. So in a lot of systems, uh, you have permission to do something and you don't have permission to do other things, right? So for example, uh, I have a key uh, my key unlocks my office door. It unlocks a uh, photocopy room 
in our department. I have another key that uh, unlocks this, but I can't off I can't uh, unlock my colleague's door. Okay. Now imagine that for some reason I was able to take, um, say, I had three friends, and we were able to take our three keys and look at all three of them, and we can see like some sort of common patterns across them, and then somehow we can infer what a master key must look like in order for the master key to be able to open all three of our locks plus our three individual keys to be able to open those locks. Uh, there's only a certain number of combinations. Now we have a master key and now I can go unlock my colleague's door, okay? So that would be an example of escalation of privilege. Um, so basically you, you're, you find some loophole that lets you do something that you're not allowed to do, you're not supposed to be able to do. Uh, the most common way this pops up is uh, usually with, for example, let's say you're a website and I wanna infect your computer with my website. That's actually really hard because your browser's not going to let me like just install random stuff on your computer. And even if I'm able to breach your browser to install stuff, that's an escalation of privilege. Uh, then your operating system is probably running in some limited user mode. OK, so it's not going to allow like a deep systems uh, change without you typing in a password or something like that. But maybe I find some vulnerabilities in Windows or OS 10 or whatever you're using. And somehow I'm able to bypass that. So I'm able to get root access or super user access. And now I'm able to, to install it. So I can go all the way from my website through the browser, through the operating system into your system files. Absolutely should not be able to do that. But if you string together the right vulnerabilities, it is possible. Uh, so we see these attacks you know, every day, every week, uh, some these types of attacks come out, then they get patched right away. Um, but anyway, there is this sort of back and forth. Uh, but a lot of them are centered on this escalation of privilege. How can you get root access on a machine uh, where you're running as a, as a limited user? How can you break out of the browser uh, to, to actually get access to the operating system? That kind of thing. <clears throat> okay. Um, so anyway, that's sort of the detail of Stride. Uh, are there questions about it? Is it not clear what some of the distinctions are here? Any comments about it? So it's fast, so there's no overhead. So the problem with TCP is just that because it requires that handshake, it requires more time, more traffic in both directions. So there's a chance of missing um, the traffic? Like yeah, exactly. So it can get dropped and you don't know that it's dropped. So usually it's used in scenarios where if you don't hear back, you just ask again. So it's not like mission critical things. It's also used a lot for things like, um, say you're streaming, like so you're on Netflix. Yeah, so you're on Netflix and uh, some frames in the video get dropped. Do you really want to pause your video, buffer it, and really get those frames? No, you'll just drop them and you won't even visually see that they're dropped. Um, so that's another example where UDP could be used. Yeah. Just about the of service. So with emergence of cloud computing, now things are very distributed. We have localized content delivery. So is it still possible to have a worldwide type of DOS attack? Yeah, yeah, so, so if you uh, host your site on a content a CDN, uh, then denial of service is very hard. Uh, you're basically gonna have to beat the bandwidth of Cloudflare or some company like that. Um, uh, not every website uses uh, CDNs. And then CDNs make other things difficult. So there is a reason that not everyone just puts everything on CDNs. Um, so to give you one example that we'll circle back to is uh, we, we talk about this HTTPS protocol or SSL. So that basically gives you a secure tunnel from the user to the web server. But now your secure tunnel ends at the CDN. It doesn't go all the way to the server. Or if it does, there's some custom weird crypto that's happening to make that happen. Um, so that's an example where uh, now you have these middle people where your traffic's getting decrypted in the middle from the CDN. Uh, and so if it's confidential data or things like that, then do you want the CDN to know like the contents of your inbox uh, for email and, and things like that? Maybe you don't want to. So CDNs, uh, they have pros and cons, basically. And that's actually the general story of all security. One thing that we'll come back to again and again, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll write it down in two seconds, is uh, in security, there's no solutions, only trade-offs. So, Every security has its pros and its cons. Uh, so it usually helps with something, but it, it makes something worse. Yeah. 
Okay, other questions about stride? Okay, so is this going to let you look at a cryptographic protocol and determine whether it's secure or not? Obviously not, okay? You can at least think about, well, that's, that's a tampering attack or that's a confidentiality attack. Uh, that's sort of the level that you would get uh, from this, but it is a good way. And if you're thinking about making sure that you're trying to get as many attacks as possible, a lot of times you can sit down and you can think like, I have, I don't know, I have this new car and it has all these like network features and my car is basically a computer now or it's like a cluster of like 50 car uh, computers. Is it really secure? Well, what about spoofing? What about tampering? What about repudiation? Repudiation doesn't really apply to a car, but you know, information disclosure, what about where everywhere I've dro drove? What about denial of service? Like say someone's able to take out some component of my car and then it causes the brakes to fail. You know, that could be a problem, you know, so you can start to think about uh, different attack venue, uh, vectors, and they might be things that you wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Okay, so that's that's sort of the story with Struck. Okay, so next thing we'll look at is uh, what we call an evaluation framework. Okay, so this is a way of comparing different alternatives for solving the same task. Uh, it's motivated by this concept that I just explained, there's no solutions, only trade-offs. So generally, not it, there's very little security that's perfect. Uh, usually there's a price to be paid for, for different security. So um, a basic tension that often arises, for example, is between usability and security, right? So you can add all of this security on, but then it becomes harder to use. And if it becomes harder to use, then users might disable it. And if they disable it, then you're not benefiting from the security. So you just defeated uh, the whole purpose of, of doing it. Um, so, so anyway, so these, these are sort of the trade-offs. So let's say that you have a bunch of alternatives, different ways of doing one task, and you wanna try and figure out which is the best. You might not be able to conclusively answer that, but what you could do is you could sort of lay out a landscape of, these are kind of the important properties that I care about and these are the systems that do well on this property and but they do bad on this property and things like that okay an evaluation framework is really simple and really hard at the same time okay the actual deliverable itself will not blow anyone away uh it it looks just like let's say you were buying a car and there's three models of the car and there's like a little chart and it tells you okay this one has this engine and this one has this engine or whatever uh, the case may be. Uh, an evaluation framework is just a bunch of rows that are a bunch of alternatives. There's a bunch of columns which are properties that you want and then there's some symbol that says whether it's good, bad, ugly for that particular property. Okay, uh, so usually we put the symbol, you don't have to do it any particular way. We tend to use a dot, uh, so like a full dot means it achieves that property. Half dot means kind of achieves it and then empty means that uh, it doesn't achieve this particular property, okay? So an evaluation framework doesn't look like anything special. You've seen this kind of chart lots of times in, in life uh, where you just have a comparison between alternatives, okay? But doing a good job with your evaluation is actually a lot harder than it seems, okay? So the hard parts are how do you figure out what the rows should be? How do you figure out what these columns are going to be in terms of the properties that you're going to compare it on and then how do you do the actual sort of dot by dot analysis and uh, it can it can end up being yeah a lot harder um, than it seems okay so it's uh, the deliverable is a simple chart But coming up with criteria is harder than it seems.
Okay. The other uh, sort of motivation for evaluation frameworks and attack trees especially as well is, um, and this is also another part of this course, another kind of core kind of principle is, I'll phrase it this way, uh, there's more to security than security. Okay, um, so when you consider the security of something, you really have to take a kind of holistic approach. You have to look at um, all the different aspects that you can look at. And so one mistake that a lot of security people make is they just think about the security itself. So they come up with some new proposal for doing something and it is really secure. And if you only care about security, it's the best thing that you could possibly do, okay? but maybe it costs a million dollars. And because it costs a million dollars, nobody will use it. So is that actually useful? Like, no. who cares if it's good on security, right? If it, if it costs a million dollars, it's not useful. What if the usability is really bad? Like, it's just so demanding of the user. Like, users have to solve, like, mathematical equations in their head, type the answers in, and then that's going to, like, mask their messages. And it's, you know, really super secure encryption, but, like, no user can actually do that. Then, obviously, nobody's going to use it, right? Um, Maybe you have your company and you've been in business for 10 years. You have lots of data. Your data is in a certain format, right? And now I have this new thing and it's much more secure, but it doesn't work with your old system. It's not backwards compatible at all. There's no way to take your old stuff and port it into the new system. Is that going to work? It's not going to work, okay? So there is security. Security is really important. You want to do the thing that's the most secure. But if you actually look around at real world security, you end up seeing that actually for most things that people do or most organizations do, they don't actually end up choosing the most secure option. They usually choose the thing that balances security with good usability, it's easy to deploy, it's cheap, it's backwards compatible. You know, They have all these sort of non-security uh, criteria in their mind, okay? So the idea of an evaluation framework is to think about not just security, but think about all these extra things as well uh, in order to, to, to really evaluate not is this the most secure tool, but is this the most useful tool to be used to imp improve security. So generally what we do, uh, so there's different ways of doing it. There's no set way of doing it. I'm kind of following a, a more an academic uh, result, um, but Generally what we'll do is we'll come up with criteria and I tend to cluster it into three ways or the, the original authors did it this way and I, I really like it. Uh, so you have your security concerns so you want to be concerned about it. The other main cluster is usability. Um, so if the system is going to involve humans at some point uh, then you want to think about the usability of the system. And the other is like all the compatibility issues and things like that so uh, they call it deployability the cost, um, that kind of thing. Okay, so you have all your deployability concerns which have nothing to do with security. You have all the usability concerns that have nothing to do with security and then you have the security concerns. And when I say they have nothing to do with security, I mean directly they don't have anything to do with security, but indirectly they do because if it's not usable, then people aren't gonna use it or they're not gonna use it right and then you're not gonna get the security benefits. Okay, so the framework itself will look something like this. You're going to have a bunch of systems. We'll just call them like alternative one. Maybe you do one, maybe you do two, maybe you do three. Okay, um, and the important part here is that these are actually there are different ways of doing the same thing, okay? They're not different ways of doing different things, okay? So you wanna kind of compare apples to apples. You wanna compare things that are actually trying to do the same thing uh, to each other, okay? So that's, that's an important uh, consideration that, that sometimes, we used to do assignments where you would do this evaluation framework, and so a lot of times a common pitfall was that uh, people would compare things that aren't actually alternatives, right? So 
um, like let's say you want to do network security and like you you have a firewall and you have an intrusion detection system. Those aren't really, you're not really comparing those two things. You can do both, right? You can do uh, intrusion detection and you can have malware detection and you can have a firewall. They're not exclusive. Usually when we talk about alternatives, like you're doing one, if you're doing one, you're not doing the other, okay? They're actually alternatives uh, to, to doing it, okay? Then you have a bunch of properties that follow that either uh, you know, a security property, a usability property, or a deployability property. All right, so these are true alternatives. Sometimes you evaluate like kind of primitives that can be composed, but anyways. Um, so alternative means that generally they're not, they're sort of mutually exclusive and they all are, at, at the very least, they're all trying to actually do the same thing. Uh, you have a set of properties. And one trick to make this, um, let's say we're, let's go back to whatever, intrusion detection or whatever. Uh, you could be like, keeps malware out, right? So I might be like, okay, this is good. It keeps malware out. Um, you know, but you could also phrase the property as like doesn't let malware in, and if you phrase it as doesn't let malware in, then um, uh, actually let me let me put it differently. Let's say it um, let's say you phrase it as it allows malware. Okay, so like it it doesn't protect against a certain class of malware. Um, so that's your property. In that case, uh, you actually want to get a bad rating like bad is good, right? Like you, you want to not have that property as opposed to have that property. So the trick with the property is find a phrasing so that it's always positive, meaning that you always phrase it in such a way that you want that property. So the best system wants that property. So I shouldn't have to read the property to figure out whether this is something I want or it's something that I don't want, okay? So they should all be phrased in terms of, um, of positive things. <coughs> So they're all desirable properties, okay? And usually it's just a, a matter of switching around your grammar uh, to turn one into another. Okay, and then you have some sort of criteria. So like maybe this has, so I want this property so that this is good that it has this dot. Uh, maybe it has like kind of like a half dot here. Uh, this one only has this dot. This one has a half dot here and this dot here, something like that, okay? Um, and so this might be the actual evaluation, okay? Uh, usually what you do is you have to explain every dot. So you have to say, what does it mean to get a full dot for this property? What does it mean to get a half dot for this property? What does it mean not to get a dot uh, for this property? Okay, and because we phrase all these properties positively, Alternative one looks good. Like visually I can see, okay, this is getting a lot of dots. I want these dots, right? The more dots kind of the better, right? Uh, so alternative one looks good, okay? What is the best system here? So alternative one has the most dots, but maybe I care a lot about property three. Maybe property three is like the, the most important property to me. These two are nice to have, but if I, if I don't have them, I don't really, you know, it's, it's not a deal breaker. If I don't have this, if I don't get a full dot on property three, that's a deal breaker for me, okay? So in that case, actually alternative three is better, right? It's the only one that gets a full dot there. Even though alternative one has more dots, this one has it for this, okay? So the point of the evaluation framework, let's go back to the, the adage, right? There's no solutions, only trade-offs, okay? So I can't look at this and say alternative one's the best or alternative three is the best. It actually depends. It depends it depends on your requirements. What, what do you think about these properties, okay? So evaluation framework's not, it's a tool to let you select the best tool, but what it is is it's really just a kind of neutral presentation of all the different alternatives, all their pros and all their cons. It's not actually a tool that's gonna necessarily let you decide things, okay? So um, the, the aim here is to have a, a kind of neutral presentation of, of information.
The other thing that, that sometimes happens is, uh, especially when students do it, they might have you know two properties that are actually exactly the same. Like they, they sound different, but at the end of the day, they end up being the same thing. Um, and so that's the other thing. Like, is this property, is it actually a unique property? Is it, is it something that's different than all the other properties? How do I know how many properties? Like, do I need 10 properties? Do I need 100 properties? You know, uh, sometimes you take some esoteric property that like no one really, like three people in the world care about. Does that belong in a chart like this? Probably not. Okay, so these charts aren't going to necessarily have every property that you can think of. Uh, so you have to try and uh, sort of cur curate a good selection of properties that are actually important, that are actually things that, that people care about. Uh, so that's another thing uh, where this, even though it's really simple, it's a dead simple chart, you've seen them before, there is a kind of art into making these things and making them uh, actually good and useful uh, um, for someone. <clears throat> okay, and so here, let me just add um, some notes here. So full dot, we normally say, actually, let me, let me put it down here. So full means it, you know, achieves the property. Uh, partial dot or half dot means it achieves it, but there's some caveats. So it doesn't quite fully achieve it the way that, that we would want. Um, and then an empty dot. And it doesn't matter what symbols you use. And you don't have to use three. You can use four. You can use two. Really doesn't make a difference. Three is nice. It's it's easy enough that you can kind of read it, um, and it does a good enough job. I find so I, I like three myself. Um, so this doesn't basically doesn't achieve property. Okay. Um, So let's do an example. First off, any questions so far? So this will become clearer with an example, but yeah. Yeah, so what you should not do is sort of add this up, like be like, okay, this is where two points and half dots are worth one point. We're going to add up each row and the one with the biggest number is the best. Um, so that, that's how you might be tempted to, to decide uh, based on weight. Um, you know, the, the, the idea here is that it actually doesn't make that decision for you. So it just sort of presents the information and it lets the person look at it and decide what the most important feature is itself. Is that your question or is your question about the weight for these three? Yeah. Yeah, so that that is there's no rule for that. So I can't teach you like this property is always more important than this property or not. Um, so that's something that like in a context of a, a company or something, you would take them the chart and then they would sort of have to tell you what they think is most important or that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so it can literally be anything. So uh, in previous years, we've given an assignment where it's like, go do an evaluation framework on anything you want. People pick protocols, they pick applications, they pick um, different objects, right? Um, you can think about, I don't know, like money versus a check versus digital cash or something like that. Like, like you can really do it with anything. Yeah. Okay, so let's do it with something. Uh, so I'll, I'll do the example that is actually the example that this idea came out of uh, the paper. 
Uh, so the example I'm going to pick, and it's also something that's nice. You don't have to be an expert. All of us in this room, I guarantee that you've uh, thought about this, even if you haven't explicitly thought about it. Um, let's think about alternatives for passwords. Okay, so we all know what passwords are. We all have lots of passwords. Uh, we've used them. Have you ever done something that's not a password that does the same thing? It unlocks an account. So what have you done? Come on. All right, so biometrics. So biometrics is an alternative to passwords. Okay, so you can have your system, you have your new web app, it's awesome, and you get to decide, am I gonna make the user put in a password or am I gonna make the user give me their fingerprint or more likely have their phone you know, store that fingerprint? Which is more secure, a password or a biometric? Okay, so some people say password, some people say biometric, some people say depends. I like depends, that's my favorite answer. Um, passwords are cheap, right? How much does a password cost? It's free. How much does a, a fingerprint cost? Cost whatever the cost of a fingerprint reader is. You want a fingerprint reader on your phone, how much does that cost? Well, you're buying an amp iPhone or a Nexus or something like that, so it's gonna be a couple hundred bucks, okay? So maybe I tell you all uh, passwords are better because they're cheaper, right? So that is true, it's true that they're cheaper and if you care about costs, then, then maybe that's your decision. Uh, what's more usable? Password. I'd say a biometric. I mean, I, I think it's a lot easier to put your finger on something uh, than to type something in, remember what it is that you have to type in. Um, so I, I would go with biometrics personally on usability. Um, but that, that also says usability is too broad. Like we should be like more specific. Like what, what exactly does usability mean? So we might be like, how easy is it to enter your thing, right? So then biometrics. So if you can clarify what usability means, if you can stop talking about usability as a broad term and you can give really specific properties, then you can make a clearer, more objective like kind of criteria uh, for how you would evaluate this. Um, what about security itself, which which is more, forget about usability and costs and deployability. What about the actual security? Okay, so once again, there's a split. Um, so once again, it actually depends a lot. If it's a human chosen password, it could be terrible. If it's a system that's signed password, it's probably really, really good. If it's a biometric, it's probably somewhere in between, right? You can actually measure it. You can think of entropy of like how much randomness is in this string of, of information. Um, the other thing is like, how, what if I want to steal your password, right? Well, if it's truly in your head, you memorize it, you didn't write it down anywhere, you're not using a password manager or something like that, um, then you know, I, I can't really steal it. Can I steal your finger? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I can steal your finger, right? I don't actually even have to literally <laughs> steal your finger, right? I steal a glass that you touched, I print out like a LaTeX finger and I lift your fingerprint and I put it on and now I have your fingerprint. Right? Uh, what happens if you lose your fingerprint? Like say your finger, someone steals your fingerprint and uploads it to the web. You just get a new finger, right? You reset your finger. <laughs> okay, so you're not gonna do that, right? Um, also about, think about accessibility. What if you don't have fingers, right? Not everyone has fingers, not everyone has hands. And so is that gonna work for every human? What about passwords? Not everyone can remember a password. Not everyone has the cognitive ability to remember passwords, right? And so there's accessibility uh, that goes into usability as well. Okay, so it's complicated, right? We probably can't say at the end of the day passwords are better than biometrics, but what we could do is come up with some really crisp definitions and then, and then try and define what they are. So that's what the evaluation framework's gonna do. Before we get there, what are some other things? So biometrics are one, but there's, there's other things too. That, um, okay, so I heard RFID, um, so that's, that's fine. I'm gonna call it like a, uh, there's a whole class of things that are, are kind of similar. Uh, basically, you have RFID, I think, more of as locks, not really used to unlock your Gmail account or something like that. But uh, in terms of something you have that's physical, that's in your possession, that is common. Okay, so there are these hardware things. How do they usually work? What's a hardware token that actually lets you log into a server? Does anyone Has anyone ever used one of those? Yeah. Okay, okay. So one example would be uh, what's called the ARTSA token. Mm -hmm. 
what is this RSA token for those of you who've never used one? Okay, so what this is, is uh, it comes in different forms. Now I think you just use a phone or something like that. But anyway, traditionally what it is, it's like a little thing that's on your key. Uh, it's like a little fob and it has uh, numbers on it. Okay, and those numbers are synchronized with a server that RSA runs. Okay, and they either update every time you press a button or they update over time. There's different formats, but let's do the time-based one. So basically there's a sequence of numbers. So every 10 minutes that number changes. And when you go to log in, you type in your username, you type in your password, uh, then you type in uh, whatever your token is showing. Number. Then they go to RSA and say, this person just typed in this number. Is that what the number should actually be? And they say yes or no. If the answer is yes, then they say, okay, now is the password correct? And if the answer to both questions are yes, then they give you access. Uh, if the answer to either of those questions is no, then you don't get access, okay? So what this is, is um, sometimes we also call this class of thing uh, because it doesn't actually replace the password. It actually augments it. So it's not like you don't have a password anymore. Now you have a password plus you have a token, okay? Uh, so sometimes we call this two-factor authentication, okay? So it's a second factor. And why is it a second, not just a second thing? It's not two-thing authentication. Factor means it's kind of a different kind of authentication. So generally when we think of factors of authentication, we think of something you know, so that would be like a password, something you have, that would be like a token, and something that you are, so that would be like a biometric. Uh, so those are the three, you can think of a few other things uh, that, that uh, you could maybe use instead, uh, but those are the three basic ones. So if you require authentication to be more than one of those, we call it multi-factor authentication, or in this case, it's two-factor authentication. Does anyone know another example of two-factor uh, like authentication? Security questions, personal security questions. Okay, so personal security questions are used to reset passwords. They're usually not used directly to authenticate. Sometimes they are added as a sort of secondary authentication, but you could redo this whole chart just on reset, password reset. So let's, we'll, we'll save it. It's a good suggestion, but we'll save it for if we're going to do something with resetting passwords. Location. Okay. All right. So lots of ideas. Uh, OTP is one thing that I heard. So what does that stand for? One-time password. One -time password. Okay. Uh, so how does that work? What's a one-time password? Okay. Okay. So probably the biggest player in this space or the one that, that moved first was Google. Um, so I'll, I'll actually just call this two-factor authentication, even though this is also uh, an example of two-factor authentication. Actually, let me call it um, uh, well, whatever. I'll just call it by its brand name. So Google 2FA. So there's different ways of doing it. Uh, the basic thing is that you have a phone. That's something you have. Google's going to send a text message to that phone number. Uh, if you have that phone or you have access to the text messages that are sent to that phone number, notice that those are two different things, uh, which we'll circle back to. But um, then you basically, you get a, it's just like the RSA. So instead of looking at your token, you look at your text messages. You still have a username, you still have a password, but you have this additional factor uh, that you type in as well. Um, so it's, uh, and uh, it's a fresh password every time. Okay, so something you have is access to that phone number, something you know is a password. So it's, it's 2FA stands for two-factor authentication. Okay, any other ideas? Instead of uh, OTP, we have Google Authenticator, which is a... Yeah, so that's, I'm not gonna go through all the different fine green things, but yeah, it's the same idea, just using an app instead of your phone number. So uh, another kind of two-factor authentication. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So two things. Uh, so um, some sort of behavioral kind of metrics. Uh, so that's sometimes used implicit authentication. Um, uh, and what was the other one? Someone, oh, password managers too. Um, so yeah, so both of those would work. So let's put password managers. So implicit authentication is usually, 
I would say that right now uh, it's used a little bit differently. It's usually uh, a complement to authentication as well. So for example, uh, I have an Apple Watch and as soon as I put this on my skin, I have to type my password in once, but as long as it continues to touch skin, then it, will, it won't ask me for my password again. It just assumes that it's on my hand. If I take it off and then put it back on, then I have to put the password in again. So that's a kind of behavioral or implicit authentication, but it doesn't replace the password. It's just sort of an ad additional kind of thing. So I'm gonna drop that one from consideration, but it is a good suggestion. Uh, password managers. Uh, so this is where you, uh, you still have passwords, so it looks a lot like passwords, but you're not remembering them. Okay, so someone else is remembering your passwords for you, like your browser or your operating system. And you still usually have one password that you have to remember. So you have your master password, or the, the password to the account for your password manager. But having one password is better than memorizing 100 or 500 uh, passwords. Um, so, so yeah, so that's a reasonable uh, thing. Anything else? Can you please zero knowledge proof? Okay, so there's some like crazy cryptographic things that you could do. Um, so usually these types of things boil down to, uh, I have a cryptographic secret. So a cryptographic secret is a key. It's like a password, but I can't memorize it because it's too long. So it's stronger than a password because it's really random and it can't be brute forced. Uh, but um, yeah, so we can think of it as, uh, um, and so usually when you store a key, you when you wrap a key up in a data format, we often call them certificates. We'll get into what certificates are, but I'll call them client certificates. And then what you do with the client certificate or the key that's in it, whether you're doing a zero knowledge protocol or whatever the case may be, um, is up to the protocol itself. But this is something, so it's some crypto secret that you have uh, instead of a password. Okay. It's like very uncertified for someone certification authority. Yeah, yeah, so they would, uh, so that's more about identity. So we'll, we'll circle back to that. So that's solving a different problem, but yes, yeah. Anything else? Okay, so I just downloaded a new app on my phone, say it's a game. Uh, they want me to log in uh, to, to the game. Uh, do I create a username and password? I mean, that's an option, but like, when's the last time you installed a game and you actually created a new username and password? What else could you do? Okay, so they'll be like, oh, just sign in with Facebook. You already have a Facebook account, just put in your Facebook password. You already have a Google account, you have a Twitter account. Um, so that's called single sign-on, federated identity. Uh, There's sort of similar things. I'll call it uh, single sign-on. This is good, it's kind of like a password manager. You only have one password, so I just have my Facebook password and I don't have to remember 100 other uh, passwords. Not so good because every time I use my game, Facebook learns, right? So they know what, what time I use the game. Uh, maybe they know how long I, I use it depending on how it's set up, but every time that I'm prompted for a sign on, uh, they at least learn that fact so they know what I've installed uh, and all sorts of other things. Uh, about me. So is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. Why, why is Facebook providing this service for free? Right? Because they get data on you. Right? So it's, it's not really free. Right? You, if you're not buying the product, you are the product. You know, that kind of thing. Um, okay, yeah. So facial recognition I'll put under biometrics. So for biometrics, that will include facial recognition. So like my phone has face ID. Um, before my old phone had a password. Uh, sorry, a fingerprint uh, before it. So that we'll consider that biometrics. It could be iris. Uh, there's there's different uh, kinds of ways of doing biometrics. Uh, the reason that we're clustering them together is just because when we do the evaluation, they'll just come out the same way. Or there might be like one dot that's different, but usually these categories tend to, to sort of move together. Um, another thing is, okay, so my phone now has the facial thing. Uh, before it had the uh, the fingerprint. What did it have before the face, before the fingerprint? Okay, so I had some sort of pin. Uh, how did I enter the pin? Did I type it in? Okay, so I typed, if I had an Android, I'd actually swipe it, right? So that's not really a pin. It's kind of like, it's like a picture or a pattern or something like that. So that could be different enough. Uh, so we call it, uh, we call these graphical passwords.
So there's been a lot of um, more from the academic community, but there's been a lot of studies of graphical passwords. Like say I show you a picture and I ask you, your password is to click on like five different points in the picture. Uh, there's a lot of positive like research that shows that users can remember that better than they can remember uh, they can remember names. Uh, the, the problem though is that a lot of people click on the same thing. There's something interesting about that picture. They all click on the same thing. Um, so anyways, it's it's questionable how good it is. But yeah. but anyway, there's lots of research on that kind of thing. Android liked it. They experimented with it. Uh, so that was the first really large rollout of a graphical password, probably comparable to a pin, right? You know, lots of people did simple patterns. So there's probably 10 patterns that would uh, unlock 80% of the phones. Um, so you can question about the security itself, uh, but there are some benefits to it in terms of usability and things like that. Uh, it looks a lot like a password, uh, but but it's maybe slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can argue about the actual entropy of a, a swipe pattern as opposed to a, a pin. But uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, I'll tell you next class. But but when humans choose pins, they're also very weak. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's usually not that much better. Okay. Does anyone else have these? Are the eight that I'm going to do? I always do these eight. Uh, but if anyone wants to contribute a couple more for our consideration, uh, though I won't add them to the list, go ahead. I didn't find any sort of location. Okay, so you could do some sort of location-based. Uh, once again, that tends to be kind of like the behavioral stuff. It tends to be an augmentation to it. So usually it's not strictly location. Um, there could be some like security, like um, by security, I mean like security agencies, like national security kinds of things where it's just solely location-based. Uh, I know at Concordia, for example, I don't know what the deal is, but I have this like thing that's on my office door, like just outside of it. And the security people are always like walking up with their phones and tapping it. It's like some sort of RFID thing. And it, uh, it proves that they are actually on campus or something like that. Uh, I've never really sat down to figure out what that is. Um, I've thought about taking it off or uh, taking it off and putting another one there or stuff like that, but I would never do that. I would never do that. Um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, yeah, so you could think of location. Uh, it's definitely used to augment. So uh, if I'm going to Google and I have a password, but I'm coming from somewhere in the world that it doesn't think that I am, then it's going to be a lot more, you know, it's not going to auto log me in. It's going to say you have to actually explicitly enter your password or it might give me security questions or that kind of thing, yeah. So that geolocation stuff is, is uh, it's something to consider as well, but yeah. But we're um, giving our um, confidential information at the same time uh, to the social networking site or any other things because they know where we are, where I am now. Yeah, exactly. So they can track me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what this actual framework is meant to capture. So that's a concern. Right, privacy is a concern. So we could have a column that's about privacy and we're going to ding a bunch of these things on privacy. Like we'll ding the single sign on because Facebook, Twitter, Google, they're learning everywhere you're signing on. Uh, location you can't do much about. I mean, you can certainly not share your location as determined by the GPS on your phone, but who makes your phone, right? Google makes your phone or Apple makes your phone, right? Um, you know, so you can kind of turn it off, I guess, but like, do they really not know where you are? I, I doubt it. Um, and then you, you have an IP address anyways, and your IP address, unless if you're proxying or using Tor or something like that, uh, you can determine a lot, maybe not an exact location, but you can certainly see what city you're in, uh, that kind of thing as well. So yeah, we leak a lot of information just on our day-to-day -day existence on the web. Okay, any other things that people wanna add? Uh, yeah, so you could have, um, yeah, so, so this is actually another uh, kind of thing. So if you get like, say I get a new Apple device, it wants me to get another one of my Apple devices and like click something on it to authenticate uh, that particular device. Once again, it's usually used as an augmentation. So it's in addition uh, to, to typing in a password, uh, but that's the kind of thing. Another thing is social authentication. So maybe I, per this is more of a reset, but let's say I forget my Facebook password then maybe you go ask a bunch of my friends on Facebook whether I am the person that I am or I can recognize their faces or something like that, uh, then they might believe that I am. So that's kind of like knowledge-based authentication. So there's a lot, definitely a lot more than these eight. These eight is a good, this eight is a good start uh, to it. So uh, what we'll do is next class, we'll roll with these eight. Uh, we'll come up with what the column should be. Uh, then we'll do an actual evaluation as a sample. 
Then I'll show you the research paper where they do a much more extensive job of it. And then we'll move on to other stuff. Okay? So thank you and see you next class.